Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So good evening, everyone. Um, we're very happy to be the speakers and the panel for the last session for the Leather Fair. And our host could not have described our session better. You know, so the risking creative businesses for growth, I remember what she said. We have amazing talent in this space, there's no doubt. Um, there's so much creativity within this room, and this is just maybe 1% of the creativity we have in Nigeria. Um, every day you meet people across different spaces, and the creative sector is quite large, from design, uh, manufacturing, um, fashion, media and entertainment, um, even sports to some extent. Um, but what we want to see is businesses that people take ideas, they grow, they create jobs um, by first sustaining the entrepreneur who has the idea first and then also create other jobs for other people. And so our very strong panel lineup is going to look at our theme in different dimensions. So first of all, we'll, we'll look at what are even the challenges to growth for businesses and entrepreneurs in the creative sector. What are things that should be done, not just by the entrepreneurs themselves, but even people that are looking or are already currently supporting entrepreneurs? What do we need to understand by um, the entrepreneurs and the businesses within the creative space? And what are the imperatives and really the opportunities that we can take advantage of? The panel that we just had before this helped us to set some of the context. So even though it was a panel on branding, there was a lot of conversation around the business of building and running and sustaining a creative business. So that initial panel was also a good foundation for that. And the statistics really are quite impressive. There are people there, if you look at the creative economy, there's a statistics I checked recently by Jobberman. Um, according to the 2021 report on the creative sector, it currently employs about 4.2 million people. And this is still a sector that is largely informally based. But a number of people who play in the creative business are micro-businesses. Very small, significantly informal, in some certain respects not even registered, but even the formalized ones really don't stay beyond a certain viability of time. And so what we want to do today, again, is really just dimension that and have that conversation. And I'm, I'm not going to... I'm going to also listen as you are and also ask the question. Um, so. I want to start first with, let's even understanding the creative space and the challenges that entrepreneurs within the creative space experience. And I'll start with you, Folak, I mean, I love your shoes, by the way. So you wear different hats. You wear the hat of an entrepreneur yourself. Um, in your past and current life, you also wear the hat of being in spaces that interface with entrepreneurs. So what do you understand to be the challenges that entrepreneurs in the creative space, particularly in Nigeria, face? Thank you, Adenike. And good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And for once, not speaking as a central banker, but actually speaking as an entrepreneur in this space as well. So in terms of uh, the challenges that we see that uh, small businesses face, I think uh, they're well known, so I'm going to touch on a few, and then I'll also quickly see, is it okay if I suggest a few solutions as well? We'll oh, come to different. the solutions. Okay, okay. Quickly, yes. so, okay so some of the most, um, uh, the most common ones right now is high energy costs. I'm sure, and I speak to many entrepreneurs, um, and we've all seen the escalating diesel prices, and that has, co it's actually um, led to some businesses being put out of business, that's one key one that we're seeing in Nigeria. Where diesel, we were buying diesel for 250 per litre, and now it's like 700. So obviously that's going to impact costs. Another one has been high input prices, which makes it difficult for small businesses to price. Because they go to the market, they go and buy leather today. Because I also manufacture um, slides and clothing. And what we see is that you know, every other week the prices are going up. So that's another one. Then quality staff, being able to attract quality staff and being able to retain them. A friend of mine started a business. She told me two weeks ago, she has employees about seven staff. Four of them were all going at the same time. So she had to actually plead with some of them to actually stay. 
One is, another one is lack of reach and access to markets. It's been a big one for many businesses as well. Um, another one is uh, product packaging. Uh, you know, a lot of times we may produce the quality, but if we don't package it properly uh, in an aesthetic that is, has a sort of crossover appeal, to both our local market, international market is another one. Another key one is finance. Access to finance, packaging for finance, and the cost of finance. That's, that's another big one. Uh, and then shallow business understanding. You know, um, many uh, MSMEs, are, many are one-man shows or one-woman shows. And um, to actually be able to grow, there's a need to have a broader understanding than just being able to be creative. You must have some business understanding of marketing, of finance, what's the best sort of finance, um, you know, and how to recruit staff as well. So there are actually many things. Another key one is investability. You know, to grow, to scale, uh, you must be investable. And to be investable, there are a number of things uh, that banks, uh, lenders want to see in a business, including financials, including having the right quality of staff. Uh, key man risks as well. Uh, businesses are personalized largely, personalized to walk. But if you really want to run, things, processes need to be institutionalized. Uh, market relevance. The markets that we serve constantly change. I've been uh, designing for a good few years, even though not commercially. I do it for pleasure as well. But what I designed two years ago is not so relevant today. The market constantly moves. So that's just uh, uh, <laughs> initial. That's a point. short list of the long list. Thank you. So you've 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 outlined. I'll put them in two buckets. The, the challenges that have to do with the operating environment, so macroeconomic fundamentals, diesel prices, all of that, doing business in Nigeria, power, and then the, the challenges of the entrepreneur also understanding that space. So I'm going to move to Muiwa. Um, you are in the space of supporting businesses to grow. And two of the challenges that Falakemi spoke about had to do with investability and even understanding the business of running a creative business. So... For the entrepreneurs in this room, what are the metrics? This is the risking, the session is the risking creative businesses for growth. How can a creative entrepreneur or even an entrepreneur know that they're growing? How, what are those metrics to, to look at your business and say, am I growing? If I'm growing, what will tell me whether I'm growing or not? Um, okay, so basically, um, I think we'll Start with your market share, so understanding the size of the market I'm playing in and uh, how much of the market space do I have. Then we can now start talking about things like your revenue, uh, how much money am I making for my business. Then you talk about your gross margins or your gross profit. Then you can talk about your net profit. So what, what is gross thing. margin, gross profit? Okay, so <laughs> basically we're talking about uh, your sales less your cost of sales. Okay. So that gives you a gross profit in simple terms. Mm -hmm. Then we're saying... From my gross profit, I now take my business expenses and other expenses mm -hmm. into it. Then I get my net profit. Mm -hmm. So in simple terms, most businessmen are not even able to compute whether they are profitable or not mm -hmm. and even able to understand their pricing strategies for their mm -hmm. products. Thank you very much. So essentially making more than you are selling and just even having a good grasp of that at a very minimum is very important. Okay. Sarah, I'm going to come to you. You're also an entrepreneur. And you were the heart of running the business, but also supporting other people to build, either from a talent perspective and all of that. What are we missing in this conversation in understanding the challenges? Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody. So first of all, I would say I will talk as a consultant right now. Um, many times we do not know what our real challenges are there is a concept called cause and effect analysis in consulting many people see the effects as the causes right so there's there's also something called five wise analysis meaning that when you ask why five times you would get to the root of the problem so many times you would say something like um i'm not getting funding and that's my problem that's not your problem 
that's an effect of a cause. Why are you not getting funding? Is it because your bookkeeping is not right? Is it because like corporate governance is not right? Is it because you're not producing standard work that can actually scale, right? So I think what's actually missing here is the nitty gritty, right? I have been a part of um, numerous acceleration programs, right? So most times we talk about these problems and all of that, but how come people are not still getting past these problems? Because there are some nitty gritty things, right? Sadly, I don't know if you have so much time here to actually go into all of it, but I would say the first thing is the mindset. People need to start looking at their small business as a big business. When I tell people how long I've been running Detail Africa, they're quite shocked. How long? Just Barely five years, okay. right? But we have put in place structures that will make us look like we've been doing this for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? And that's because you must see your small business as a big business, right? The mindset is the first thing. And the attention to detail, I mean, hence our name, Detail Africa. The attention to detail is key. I would advise anybody that wants to go into business, not just like creative business, to work a bit of nine to five. Honestly, that's my advice. Because when you work nine to five in a proper company, you see structure, you understand structure. Small businesses feel like I don't need structure because it's just me and this guy. Nah, you need structure because you would grow. And as they say, you don't start looking for something when you need it. Right? So yeah. So that that. The mindset is the first thing, right? Then yes, talent. Talent is a very big issue. I'm a very practical person. I don't know how to, I don't know, talk big things, but just very, very practical. The way you treat talent is important. Many people say things like, oh, artisans go away, artisans run, artisans are very crooked and blah, blah, blah. That might be true, but how do you treat this talent, right? Are you actually making them feel like they're part of the vision or are they just there working for you? Which goes back to actually looking at your small business as a big business. How are you telling these people that, you know what, I'm actually making space for you once we grow? Are you discussing shares with these artisans? If you see a very good talent, you can actually say, you know what, I can give you part of this company if you stay for the next five years, have all these contracts. Many people feel like artisans don't know anything. They just come to work. And that's a lie. Many of them, yes, they might not be so educated, but you can bring these things down in the most layman terms for them to say, you know what, you're part of this vision and treat them as such. Okay, so I was going to ask you a question later, but I think I will delve into a bit more now on the issue of talent. Because one of, and Falakemi also spoke about that, and one of the conversations from yesterday, and even a few today, talked about part of, the challenges with people that are running creative businesses. You, in a lot of ways, the founder has the idea, the vision, and even the skills, the skills, the design skills and all of that. And then maybe because of building the business, you get a lot of unskilled or semi-skilled, semi-literate people with that. So where do you find your talent from? And in one or two practical ways, how do you, because you make it sound easier than it is. And, they're, they're, and people, I'm sure a number of people here will say, no, my, one of my main issues is that. So where do you find your talent from? And if you can even give one or two things so that we understand, you know, practical ways to also get people to come on board into the business and help to do that because it is a major problem and challenge. Okay. So I think the first thing I would say is let's limit this conversation because when we say creative industry, that's really big. Mm -hmm. And we're largely so let's speak to the leather since we're in the leather. Yes, yes. So let's like mm -hmm. limit it somewhat. Mm -hmm. So how do I get my talent? I mean, essentially, I do a lot of research. Sadly, many people don't actually Google enough. I do a lot of research, right? I go to the places where the kind of talent I need are in large quantities, and I go there and I speak to these people and I test them, right? So I take a very careful approach to this. I don't rush these things, which goes back to having a nine to five for a bit because dead, you're not hungry going into this thing. You're making some money and trying to build this, right? But anyways, um, so I go to these places, discuss with these people, I test them. So I just don't take someone, oh, I can do this, I can do this, show me your stuff. No, I need to test you, right? And then once that happens, we now actually begin conversation. So there's a kind of like probation period, right? 
and what I've done with my own talent so far is I show them the end product a lot. The fancy pictures, the big women and men carrying the items, it inspires them to know that, you know what, I can do this, I can do more of this. Many times they're just walking from the back end and not knowing what their output looks like in the outside world. So you show these people. So many people are afraid that they will leave thinking that you're ripping them off. But many times they understand that I'm part of a big picture. So I mean, anyway, so I actually go to these places and I get the talent, test them out. And yeah. Okay. So even the mindset thing is not just for the entrepreneur, but also even for people that for work the whole with them. team. Thank you. For the whole team, yeah. Thank you. So for like him, I'm going to come back to you. One of the things Sarah spoke about was structure. And um, so Sarah spoke about the importance of structure. So I want to talk about the, the what does structure mean? And particularly from a risk perspective. Because sometimes when you think of structure, you think of a large business, a multinational an already established business. Um, how should um, entrepreneurs within the space, particularly small and growing businesses, start to think of structure from a risk mitigation perspective? Thank you, Adenike. Usually, let me just even start by um, saying what risk management is, because usually at MSME level, we don't talk about risk management. And we think, oh, that's something for all the big banks. But really, it's very simple. You know, um, all MSMEs, you're in the business to make money uh, or to have a social impact, um, to do good. And the risk management is, and so you're out there to pursue business opportunities. But on the risk, uh, in pursuing an opportunity, there's always a risk of loss. And that loss can be in terms of um, money, it could be in terms of time, it could be in terms of loss of capacity, it could be in terms of loss of reputation, which can impact your ability to achieve uh, growth or to grow your business. So your question was about structure. One of the things that, because um, we all need money to do our businesses, right? But you cannot go to a bank, to a microfinance house, without some, they will expect to see certain things. When I speak to like a Lagos State Employment Trust Fund that wants to uh, lend money to, um, to uh, entrepreneurs, or even if I speak to a chief risk officer, they tell me that of every 100 applications that they see, they are only able to lend to 10. So all that money is sitting there whereas it could be deployed to people like yourselves. So what, do they, what structures do they expect to see? They expect to see some bookkeeping. They expect to see some, um, your accounts. They expect to see records of your key staff. They expect to see, um, you may not have a full um, risk management structure, but there's some basic things that will help you in understanding the risks that your organization face. And I would suggest two things. Please just note this. They are common business management tools. One is doing a SWOT analysis. And that's just understanding what your strengths are as a, as a company. So it's S-W-O-T. S is for your strengths of your organization, of your business. Uh, w is, that's the strengths that you can maximize. Uh, your weakness, W is for weaknesses. What are the weaknesses? What do we need to improve upon in my business? Then looking a bit outside, what are the opportunities that I need to position to, um, uh, to, to pursue? Then what are the threats? What are the risks to my business? And to do that, you need a good understanding. You can't just sit down in your shop, in your business environment without understanding what is going on outside you. So what are the things in the political environment that can impact my business. Because we know, like with regulation, for example, a new regulation can just come out and impact. We saw BDCs now. We saw what happened to BDCs. We saw what happened to cryptocurrency dealers. So you must constantly, as an entrepreneur, even if you can't do it yourself, you must have a young graduate or somebody, um, a family member that can understand the environment and share it with you. So you must have your, you must have your accounts um, and you must budget. What's your budget for the year? 
And as you perform the budget on a monthly basis, what am I forecasting? What, what sales do I expect to be able to meet? And then what sales did I achieve? So just some basic records that you can show to a, to a lender to show that you understand the environment within which you work. Thank you for that, Kemi. So you've listed out a number of things, and, and sometimes it can sound very overwhelming. Mm. Um, because to some extent, you know, he said, oh, there are a lot of programs that already tell people these things. So Muiwa, is there help? I mean, you run SME Mall. If I'm running a business, I'm already bogged down with managing people, uh, managing tax people, managing Nigeria. And then, you know, I want to, I need money, I want to loan, they're saying I should come do a bank, bank pl buy a business plan, put together my financials and all of that. As a larger business, in a lot of ways, you can think of larger consulting companies. Are there services, are there people that are available, that understand the challenges that small businesses have and are able to support them? And if they are, where can one find them? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, so basically, let's take support structures as we're talking about building. If I'm building a house, I need to know how many floors do I want to get to. That will determine what and what I need, basically. So now, one of the first things is uh, these SMEs are lacking growth toolkits. So when I say growth toolkits, a lot of them, the micro guys that are just starting businesses, cannot afford to go to the big boys for bookkeeping. Their price points are very low. They need something very convenient and affordable. So we have a platform which we call the SME Mall that was designed to be able to be accessed by these micro companies. So a small company wants to start it has incorporation there, we do it for you. You want to do your logo, you do it at a low price. You want to do your um, teen registration, from there you want to do your bookkeeping. And even the bookkeeping, what happens is, they, can, they cannot even afford to pay for the bookkeeping using a virtual assistant. So what we have is they'll utilize a tool and then they are onboarded to be able to do it themselves. So you will buy, you sell a product, you just impute it and everything, your financials come out. Because what we've realized is they are very price sensitive um, and they need a lot of hand holding. So part of what the platform also does is we provide one-on-one -on -one advisory once a while for these guys to support them. And then which enables them to understand the businesses. And then we always let them know that when you're transiting from a hobby to a profitable business, it's a whole lot of work. A lot of them still do their books from personal accounts and a few other things. So that is what the SME Mall as a platform does. So that's a growth toolkit. Now the second support structure is when you have things like mentorship series or mentorship associations. Uh, it will be good for the creative sector to have people that are far ahead in the industry, have prodigies they guide. Because even myself as I am here, I have a mentor who once in a while, I'm having this problem, guide me this way. Because he avoids you making costly mistakes even from the start of your business which has to do with things around your purchasing, your value chain management, even legal issues. Um, then we can out from the mentorship, then we go to associations that deal with advocacy. It's a very good support structure for this industry because a lot of the problems you have, if you have a larger body that is being told, this is what we are all going through, and then that is taking the problems to your regulators or your key stakeholders, to disentangle these problems, it will also help the business because irrespective of how much you sell, diesel cost will affect you. That is not of your own doing. And whether we like it or not, there's a price point at which your product is unattractive and the people still won't buy it. And then the last one is uh, the capacity building. Now, it's, uh, I've read a bit about the creative sector and tried to understand it. And I've realized that in Nigeria, I am not yet aware of structure around capacity building for different leather products. So meaning a Gucci as a foreign entity, to be able to be a, produ a production person there, you have to go through X, Y, Z, maybe one year at the tannery and a few other things like that. So we need to create structure around developing the talent of these people, not just somebody has this, he can do it, and then we start uh, helping him produce because that is what allows you to have your product to be exportable. Because without the right standards, without adhering to the tannery standards that are abroad, 
you cannot be able to sell or export outside Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also, um, after the next round of questions, we will take questions from, from the audience, so please um, be on standby. Um, Sarah, Muiwa said something around the importance of advocacy uh, to be able to push policies and legislation that benefits a whole. When we were doing the preparatory conversations for this, you talked about collaboration. What, what do you want entrepreneurs to understand about collaboration and why it's important to work with others in their space? And in your space, in this leather industry space in particular? Okay, so um, first of all, I would say in this part of the world, we have a very um, adverse approach to partnerships when you go to the average person to partner they just feels like you know i don't want to partner like i want to own my own stuff we sadly in this part of the world people prefer to own 100 percent of 100,000 than to own 10 percent of 10 million right and that's what happens so collaboration in this context there's a lot of ways we can actually collaborate right I think first of all what we need to do is to understand the industry from the point whereby we understand who is at what level in the industry. This industry consists of different parts. There's downstream. So let me use the oil industry as some type of like point of reference here. There's the downstream, there's the upstream. There are the tanneries, there are the white label production um, houses, um, then there are the brands. The brands are consumer facing. The people that produce sometimes are not consumer facing. Then they're the tanneries. So I feel like each of these categories in the industry needs to come together and say, how can we increase our output? Right? So the types of collaborations I would love to see are in this context. So, for example, um, production. Nothing actually stops us from having some type of like leather production hub where it is based on international standards because we have a couple of those at like Jack and Day Art, Art Market, there's one in Edo State, a couple of places but the issue still remains attention to detail. At the end of the day, if the MD of Providers Bank, if an ED in First Bank, if these people cannot carry your products, there is a limit to the adoption. And at the end of the day, we need these influential people to promote what we do. Right? So that's why for us at, at Detail Africa and Craftlink, we are more concerned about that because for us to go out, we need to make sure that our items can be, can be proudly carried by these people. So collaborations in that regard also Something that has really worked for us at um, DA is we do a lot of collaborations, different types of collaborations, distribution, um, affinity programs, a lot of things. Because for us, we are very big on, you don't have to be everywhere to be everywhere. You can have 100 distribution partners across the world from Mushin. So all of these collaborations are very, very key. But like I've said, first is let's understand the industry. And each of these categories needs to form bodies to increase their outputs, right? And that's the only way that the government would actually take us seriously. The government cannot help one person here, one person here, one person here. They help us a cluster. So we need to start forming clusters. And our structure, our attention to detail needs to be at the forefront. We need to understand that we are producing products for the world, not for Nigeria. That's how China came out of poverty in the past 20 years. They became the producer of the world. I have a couple of contacts in China that send us accessories and some kind of things because the ones in the country are not very amazing. When you see the way these people are so detailed with this thing, you understand that they're not joking with this thing. They understand that these same people that supply us probably supply some US brands. So they take all these things so serious and that's what we need to start doing. Not just making like a bag making oh it's a bag now stitch 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 and send no you need to understand that you are sending this to the world so that's the perspective that's very key yeah. thank you very well said thank you someone was talking yes thank you 
we can't finish this conversation without talking about funding. And you are the person I'm going to ask for funding from different perspectives. Um, what do, okay, I will start with, I know that the creative sector immediately follows the agri sector in terms of major funding programs that have been announced. From the development finance level to the major bank in Nigeria to even a number of other um, development sector partners and non-profits that fund the space. But the funding still does not seem to be getting to people. So is it a size of the size? Is it a matter of the size of the fund? Is it a matter of the design of the funding products? Or is it the problem with the entrepreneurs who, who may not also be ready to also access this? Or is it all of the above? It's actually all of the above. Uh, because the money is out there, you know, and even banks now, they have a larger incentive to lend to you. Because if they don't meet something called the loan deposit ratio, that money goes to CBN and it sits at CBN at 0%. So they have, there, there's so many incentives out there to, uh, even in the wider economy. I'll give you an example. Now, we all know that even oil, and I, I want you to really listen to this so that you really up your game. And I'm pleased actually being here today. I've been attending the leather fair for years. And honestly, I've already bought a few things because the quality is, has improved dramatically. So well done. So it can actually be done. But what we're seeing, for example, in the economy now, if you look at the numbers, um, non-oil contributes 93, the non-oil, i.e. companies outside, outside oil and gas, they contribute 93% to the economy. Where we have an issue is that that 93% that is contributed to the economy is not, so let's, I can turn it the other way around. So oil contributes 10% in terms of less than 10%, so 7% right now, to GDP. But when it comes to um, FX, i.e. the dollars that we all need and everything, all contributes on average about 85, 90%. And then in terms of employment, oil only contributes like 1% in terms of that. So what we need to do is to get these 93% SMEs, etc to actually contribute that 93% to, um, to FX. And if we start bringing in the dollars and everything, you know, it's going to be so much, the economy is going to be more vibrant, we can get all the machinery, etc. So back to the question on, um, on funding. Like I, I mentioned this earlier, it is about meeting the criteria of the lenders and it can be difficult. But right now, and you've listened to both my fellow panelists, I think you need to note down our companies. Uh, there are so many in the ecosystem now because everybody understands that imperative. Nigeria has a huge youth population. And to turn that youth population into an economic dividend, there's an understanding now that we need to uh, empower these, uh, the youth who are the ones largely managing the SMEs with funding to help their businesses. And so you need to go to some companies to help you, you know, and, and there's so many opportunities right now. You know, for example, our fashion, our music, you can go anywhere in the world, you will hear Nigerian music. And the fashion, the film, I think the film was first. Music followed film. Now let fashion follow film and music with the right quality. And you will see that we can actually get out there. So there are many, like CBN has a creative, um, has a creative intervention. Uh, BOI, I know, supports uh, fashion. There are many entities that actually support, you know, that's, because it is recognized as one of the industry sectors where we can see growth and where we can generate employment. But you must be bankable. And that's why you have a large ecosystem. And when I say bankable, you need to be de-risked. And that's why this conversation is about de-risking. Banks will only lend to businesses that are de-risk, that are bankable, i.e. the risk of loss is minimized. And you need help. This thing about partnering 
is very important because to actually leverage opportunities, you have to, and there are different ways of leveraging opportunities. You can either exploit them yourselves, you can seek to enhance your ability to do that, but you can also share. Like me now, like I said, I'm an entrepreneur now, and I'm doing, um, doing uh, fashion, clothing, but I also want to do leather goods. I can't, I'm not going to do that myself. I'm seeking partners, but I'm making sure that the quality that they, they deliver is something that I can proudly wear anywhere in the world and that my friends can wear. So therefore, the, you, you're I'm minimizing the risk of uh, poor product quality. I hope you understand what I've said. Thank yes. You. And so, Muiwa, how does an entrepreneur make themselves bankable? You used to work in a bank. Should, should entrepreneurs even be going to bank to look for funding? And then if they do, and I mean traditional banks, uh, financial institutions, because there are different um, opinions around that. I won't share mine. Uh, but if they do go, how do they present themselves in the best bankable or investment ready um, state? Okay, um, so basically bankability has to do with uh, the entrepreneur putting their business in what you call a compelling story or narrative. So you're telling a story. Your banker needs to understand the story. So they need to see the vision that you're selling. Um, they also need to see your numbers. The numbers need to make sense to be sure that you can pay back your loan. Then um, also they need to be sure that you have the capacity as a business person. So you need to show the expertise in that field. Or if not, you need to have the leadership that can do that. Then beyond that, you now need to show how much of uh, your sweat equity you put into the business because it's also very important to the banker. He will not lend to you on a zero equity funding, no. Um, then beyond that, you also need to show a bit of track record. So I have grown this business to a point. They are more willing to lend to businesses that have been alive over two, three years than startups. So they tell you that a startup is a, it's a gamble. 50-50 and they are not willing to take the risk with the shareholders funds so what we what we suggest to entrepreneurs is uh, we have a product under the SMMO which we call bank ready so you need to know where I'm starting my business and I know two years down the line I'll need to borrow so the bank will ask you for your audited financials they will ask you to put organogram they will ask you for your business plan why do we have to wait for year two so why don't you put you through a process and where you start putting those things together? You need to have done your books for two years. Your bankers need to even understand your business ratios because they need to see what the industry is doing. And in this creative sector, which is very, uh, which is new, a lot of them will be spooked by some things. So they need to be very comfortable because it's a new industry. It's not traditional. We don't know who has made a billion dollars here. We don't know who are the big players here. We don't even know who is the pay setter to guide me as a banker. So I'll fall onto my traditional numbers and uh, practices to assess them. So that is basically what it entails. Yeah. Yes. So can I just add a practical example of when um, I actually took money from a bank? This was in the UK. I, I was a banker in the UK, but I also dabbled in property development. So I approached a bank for a million pounds. And, um, but you know, I, you see, I was director of risk, but I am also a risk taker, but it's calculated risk. And on this occasion, so I, I, I went to the bank and they were like, mm, really? So they actually, and I had bought this house that I was going to be developing. Do you know these bankers came and they came to see what I was doing. They loved the quality of what I was doing. And as they came to see me, as I took them to the house, every single house that was on the market, I was able to tell them the price of the house, the ones that were sold, I told them when it was sold, I told them who the developer was, I told them the square footage. By the end of it, they lent me that money because I had convinced them by the quality of my product, by my knowledge of the marketplace and what the, my competitors were doing. So there's, you know, when I say doing this SWOT and doing a pest analysis of what's going on around you, 
please take it very seriously because he we were mentioned something you give them the confidence this was Oyimbo men a middle-aged men lending to a black woman that they had not done this before but they lent me that money thank, thank you thank for you. sharing your experience I, I also wanted to add that in building traction particularly if you're based in Lagos I would always always recommend the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund um, as a way to also start because they do single digits interest funding um, I think from about 200 to about 5 million naira and you can start with that because when you're going into a higher when you're going to get more money the person also would want to see what have you been able how little have you been able to get what have you done with that what kind of traction and that experience even from getting small loan amounts is important I also know that even Bank of Industry also has specialized products uh, funding products that they also access but again, if you're going to take a loan, please, you have to be clear, be sure. Why am I taking that loan? Am I ready to take the loan? Does my cash flow now and in the future also speak to that? Can I get money from other sources that are grants? You know, and there are quite a number of grants that are available for younger people, for women, for people in the creative sector. If you look around, you will find quite a number of them. And, and that's something that I would definitely encourage. So thank you. A warm round of applause to our panelists, please. Thank you very much. So we now want to open to questions from the audience. Okay, so I'll start with you. One, two, three, first. Those are the three hands I saw. Um, so we'll start with three questions at once. Please your name and then your question straight to the point and then if you have any particular person you would like to answer the question. So just, okay, you're asking Sarah, Polakemi, Moewa, stand up, please. Uh, good Thank you. Oh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Aminat. And my question is for Sarah. You had talked about the lack of sort of collaboration and partnership. And it sounds like you had um, started to do some collaborations. Um, but I think what we haven't seen yet is really more of like business level collaboration. So almost like mergers or, you know, businesses coming together to sort of uh, come under a broader umbrella. So I'm curious from your perspective what the barriers are to that. Or if you have any sort of like thoughts on how we can encourage more of that. Thank you very much. Next person. Yes. The lady in black with the face cap. Thank you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Good my evening. name is Zulu Um My question goes to you. And <laughs> I've really enjoyed and learned a lot from you guys. Um, it's made mention of importing from China. Okay, I have a major problem, maybe because I've not really done enough research. We don't really have um, industries that make or maybe I've not really done my research, big industry that really do raw material. There was a time I was really looking for f industries in Nigeria that really do big time raw material. That when you say can, raw material, can you be specific so we know uh, the raw material? Let me say, if, uh, all these expensive fabric, you can just hear Italian lace, all those kind of things. But we don't really, really, really do have trusted... Locally. Locally. Okay, so what's so the how, mm -hmm. how do you, you know, when you import, the price differs, and the, how do you impute that around your pricing? Okay, thank you. Understood? Yes. So the lady, yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good My afternoon. name is Mucha Freak. My question is for Muyua. Okay, um, still on the China importation thing, I was this personally- Sarah, you're looking at Sarah. That's Muyua. This Sarah. Sorry. What's his name again? Sarah. Sarah. Yes. Okay. So I've been a great fan of DA. I've closely followed your brand along with Femi Handbags. My question is concerning the China importation thing. I've personally suffered it a lot. Um, it's, will I use the word crazy when producers or creators make, say, handbags? You have your stamp on that handbag, but you have your accessories of other brands. So you have your stamp, but you're using an LV accessory on your brand. It's shameful. And when I found out, it was because it was difficult for us to get bag accessories, our brand name, in the country. So personally, I requested for about a thousand. No, I requested for just few copies to start off as a small business. And the response I got from one of the producers, which is one of the vendors here, I'm sure maybe if he's here, he knows me, was that the least I could make was a thousand copies and it was going to cost me 250,000. As a small business, so what's I, the question? Is that a question or a comment? What's my question, question is, how 
do you handle that? Okay. Because you're saying you're five years in DA and yeah. you're able to do China importations of your brands. Because I follow your brand and I see that your accessories are strictly your brand names. Mm -hmm. And everything is clean. Thank you. Another thing too is attention to detail is a problem for a couple of us too because materials have gone up. Okay. We are now doing bring down of the value of the things we use. So attention to details is if I was using velvet for lining, I can now use tapolin because I can no longer have velvet for lining. <laughs> you know? So attention to details, like he said, how can we meet up with the way the whole yeah. cost of materials is going? How can we meet up with both China importation of accessories and still keeping attention to details because the I last class said product branding. Yes. We have to keep up with product branding. Thank you very much. So three questions for you. Seems like I'm a bit popular here, but okay. So I'll begin with the first question about collaboration. So I have talked more about those type of like, um, I'll say collaboration, right? When it comes to company or B2B type um, collaborations, like you've just said, there are different types, right? So that is a discussion we'll need to have because there are different ways you can do that. You can say at are we coming together to form one company? Are we saying we want to own our brands separately and then jointly form a new company? What are we doing, right? So that's a whole different conversation, right? So there is no generic way to answer that. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. What, will, what are the terms of that contract and all of those things? What are you trying to do? So, I mean, that's like an offline type of, of conversation. So, yeah, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, the one about input prices being high, right? So a key part of what we do at DA is branding. You'll be shocked if I tell you how much we actually spend on branding, on things that you consider to be not important. You'll be very shocked. There's a reason why Apple would sell a phone for $1,500. And if a different company was to sell exactly that phone, they could not sell it for above $500. There's a reason, branding. You're not buying a phone, you're buying an Apple product. You're not part of the Apple family, so you are paying for that. So Apple is charging you to be part of Apple. So branding is very key. I understand that money is not easy to find, right? But here's what they say. If you brand or you don't brand, a brand is being formed. If you consciously do it or just feel like, you know what, I don't want to do this, a brand is being formed, whether you like it or not. There's a reason why Techno is trying to rebrand right now. At the beginning, they were all shabby looking and all of that. Now they're trying to rebrand to look tech. Some people can never use Techno. Even if they put like a fridge inside the phone and you can charge, and you can charge your laptop, they cannot just use Techno. So branding is very important. So that would allow you put a premium on your price that other people cannot. I can see a bag by Gucci. If I was to be some foreign, if I, no, let me say this way. If I used to like buying foreign goods, which I don't really like, Gucci can charge $2,500 for this bag. And if you were to make that exact bag and charge $200, they will shout. Why? Because of the branding. So the summary of all of this is you must take branding very very seriously sacrifice is key we've done da for five years now we've made good money i can tell you that i've not seen five percent of this money everything goes back into the business goes back into branding there's a reason why we've worked with the type of companies we've worked there's a reason why some type of people buy our items because of the brand yes the quality is good right but the branding is also important the branding is the intangible part of your business that people just want to associate themselves with this brand. So that is very, very key. You must take that very seriously. So that's my answer to that question. So branding is the difference between being able to charge $100 or being able to charge $250 or $1,500. Branding. Yes, quality is key, but branding. And then regarding the um, input uh, about the China bringing in stuff, right? It's not easy at all. I cannot tell you that it is easy. It's not easy. <sighs> it takes sacrifice, like I've just said, to do these things. Sometimes the sample cost of what we bring in alone 
is like an actual shipment because you're ordering below the MOQ. But for me, I see business as a long-term thing, right? I'm not trying to eat today. I'm not trying to make money right now. I'm seeing it as a long-term thing. So I don't mind paying extra for, like I've just said, branding. When somebody carries that bag and sees the full name, that's your brand name, on those accessories, it tells them something. This is a very careful approach to this brand. It's not just, I just went to Mushin to go and buy accessory. Nah. It shows that this person put thought into this, right? So it would be painful, but you have to sacrifice to do it, right? And you also have to be very, uh, what's the word, smart about this. What accessories do you really need to brand? Which ones are the outward facing accessories that you have to brand? It, so you don't have to brand everything, right? You could brand like your lock, for example, and the rest are just on brand. So you must also be smart about this until you are big enough to now brand all your accessories. So that way, if you want to brand maybe just your locks, you could bring that in. And to bring the, maybe your earrings and the rest, you could talk to other people that are bringing things for everybody. Yeah. And then that makes it cheaper until you're actually big enough. So yeah. Thank you. And, and that last point is very important because when we think of partnerships, there are different ways that partnerships can also help us to grow. The person you are sourcing from is a potential partner. The person needs to be able to trust that you also will be able to build sustained businesses over time. So you have to also build trust, continued business growth for that other person to also get to that point. That's number one. Number two, you're getting accessories that a lot of other people are getting. Um, you, ha you, you may be deficient because you're ordering maybe, I don't know, 100. But you get other people that get to the volume where you can then have a non-branded one at the cost that you can. Then it's easier not just for you, but for the other people who are also trying to get those other things. So, Sorry, just, thank you. Okay, just to add to what you just said. And that's why we actually have to go back to collaboration. Yeah. You are also making bags using D-rings, three-quarter inch D-ring, for yeah. example, one inch D-ring. This next person is using the same stuff. So how about all of you just collaborate and bring this in and they meet the MOQ and not have to pay sample cost. So the magic word is collaboration at the end of the day. Yeah. Thank you. So last, I think, do we have, uh, do I have time for a last round of questions? Two more questions. Okay. Yes. One more at the back. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. She had raised her hand the first time. She did. Okay, please, let's take three, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so one, two, three. Yes. The microphone is behind you. Thank you. Um, something really bothers so me. So your name, question, okay, my and name then is, who your question uh, is. Femi Olanio. Okay. I'm a youth. <laughs> <laughs> something really bothers me because it's about industry data. Mm -hmm. Everybody's doing their own thing. But there's no way everybody comes together to say, this is the volume of leather we need per year. These are the number of customers we're selling to per year. And it costs across all creative industries. Is there a way that people can come together and bring data together? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, yes. I'll pass the data question to you. Yes. Um, good evening, good everyone. Evening. Thank you so much, the panelists. My question goes name? to my name is Titi. My question goes to Serum. I'm a big fan of D. Yes. So you made mention of something about um, out, um, sourcing artisans and um, trying to make them a part of the business and maybe like giving them shares or something like that. So I want to ask that as small businesses when we have like the artisans to work for us like how can we navigate this kind of collaboration as small businesses okay this i have this good artisan and i i want to ensure like the quantity like like to effectively produce my product and all of that so at what stage of our business can we consider this as an option to keep our artisans our our product and our quality can be consistent. That's Thank my question. You. Last question, please. Yeah, good evening. My name is Hamid. So my question is to you. So on the issue of um, detail, so what I realized, like um, going to the market, 
in terms of um, standards and consistency. So I realized that you are not able to get like the same quality over and over and over again. You know, you go to the market and the suppliers tell you like, uh, we don't get this one again. So how have you been able to navigate that, like maintaining that consistency? Thank you. So for that, can we please first on the data question? Okay. Thank you. Yes, in terms of data, it's, it's been a problem, but it's not a problem that is unique to the leather industry. I remember in banking, when it became uh, profitable for entities to understand the data, the banks themselves started gathering the data. So, um, whereas some of the banks, some of the entities that specialize in that space or lend to that space may have data, what I would suggest is um, to do similar to what some businesses have done in the past, is to actually start gathering some of that data yourselves to pool funds. And it doesn't necessarily need to be expensive to understand the size of the market. I've seen some market size for uh, creative. I haven't seen, and even for leather, but not necessarily in Nigeria. But then there's a way that you can get global information, marry it to our GDP forecast, our own GDP uh, information to sort of, uh, it, it's, it's about combining different sources of in information to actually come with a picture of the likely size of the market. And then even the tanneries that produce, there are loads of tanneries, I believe in Kano, for example. If they are approached, I'm sure they would have information that could help. But it's also about you, the practitioners, the entrepreneurs in that space gathering information and pooling it together. Because right now, like you said, it's all over the place. I don't know if you have an association or even under this uh, leather fair, uh, there can be registrations. And I'm sure because Femi, I know she also trains uh, people in, in terms of skilling people up on leather. I'm sure this is something uh, that uh, Femi could also take up in collaboration with other players within the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's something I'm happy to discuss with her and maybe discuss with my former colleagues at the Central Bank to see. Because you know, the one thing I've all, always heard is that it's easier for uh, the tanneries to export that leather abroad and then they manufacture and bring it back. But from what we have seen now, honestly, I think there's so much more there's so many more opportunities within the space now that we really must seek to maximize with all hands on deck. Because the future of oil is, uh, is in jeopardy. We need to create jobs. And I think this industry is one of the routes to creating those jobs and shared and inclusive prosperity. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that, Kemi. I, I also want to add that part of this kind of conversation is to show you where other business opportunities are. In a space, people are always looking to the people in front, so the people making the shoes, the bags. But ask yourself, what are the problems that these people are facing? And is there a business opportunity there? There's talent problems, right? And I'm sure there are people providing that, but perhaps that's an opportunity to find, train, upskill, and source talent for people across the leather value chain. Same with the data. So some of us may have had some background in research, consulting, or we've even been in the space. That's also another opportunity to be able to get data and information and share it because it's in platforms like this that you find the people that can, the, the data is here, is where, is across all of us, at least at a minimum starting point. So I think that those are other business opportunities that we can also think to, to also start and create businesses. So Sarah, last two questions to you. So before I answer this, last two questions. I have to just say something, right? Um, I mean, not to sound like some aspire to perspire kind of person, but about four to five years ago, I was at this letter fair, four or five years ago. I was not exhibiting. We had just started producing. People were actually exhibiting, and I would just come here to look and be like, wow, this, so like, this is amazing. So the point I'm trying to make is this is possible, right? Nobody dashed me money to actually start this, right? 
if you want to build a global business, it starts from the first day. From the first day, that's where it starts. From the first day. You can only go as far as where you're looking. Right? So I just had to say that. So that you understand where I'm coming from here. That I started like this. Right? Auntie Fermi, thank you very much. This LLF was actually a very inspiring moment for me. And this was four to five years ago. And I'm here actually speaking right now. So that tells you that anything is possible. Right? As long as you really want it bad enough. And you every day just continue to do your research to really put in the work. But anyway, so that aside. So let me answer the question. Um, about... Sorry. I feel like I've forgotten the question. So there was a talent question. Oh, yes. Talent, right? So um, when it comes to... Seeding out shares to your employees and all of that, you really need to identify who is who, who is indispensable and who is not. You can do this from the get go. You don't have to be a big company to do this, right? You just have to have a lawyer friend, someone that's like a lawyer that's like your friend. So you don't have to go to some big law firm to say, you know what, I want to do this. I'm sure everybody here has a friend that is a lawyer, right? So talk to the person and say, you know what, this is what I want to do, blah, blah, blah. Speak to the artisan. Tell them about the vision. Don't be afraid to tell them about the vision, right? Don't be afraid to give them information about where you are trying to go. Many times, people feel like this makes them leave because it feels like you're just trying to use them, but that's not true. Many times, you inspire them to understand that I'm part of something bigger than me, right? I can commit myself into this vision, right because these people are going so far so let me i want to own part of this everybody wants to own part of something that they feel like would be really great in the future right so this begins from as small as you are you don't have to be a very big come to have this kind of like conversation so, so essentially speak to a lawyer friend they would advise you speak to the artisan and tell them about your plans right and yeah the rest is history that was the last question about yes um, interestingly we're having a very similar conversation that Nigeria is not ready for a big brand so even the country doesn't have the vision that we can produce a Gucci even the country doesn't have the vision Nigeria is not ready for a big brand especially in this regard right even we as a brand there are times where we buy leather from the market and we buy everything that is in the market literally like we have our People they buy so maybe you saw it before and <laughs> you're not seeing it again because we bought it. We bought everything that's in the market, and we're not a big brand that is like a Gucci. So you can imagine that it's that small, right? So the whole point is that our supply chain needs to be better. Let me give you this uh, information. These distributors in the Mushin, some of them have contacts with the tanneries. So here's what happens: Gucci, Fendi, and those big brands. They buy maybe 20 tons of leather. What we buy is the scrap. The extras that they don't want, they just send it to Africa, right? It's all about collaboration. It goes back to collaboration. There's no reason why I, myself, 10 other brands, we say, you know what? All of us use this type of leather, right? Let's talk to the tanner and say, we want this 50 tons. It's all about how you can absorb their supply. The reason why they will not send all of it is because we cannot absorb it yet. But when we collaborate more, we are a bigger force as one, right? We're not competing. See, people own 50 bags. People in Australia can buy your bag. So don't be afraid of the next person. Like, oh, if you use this, this same leather, oh, that means there's no, nah. That's where it now goes back to brand. So it's all intertwined. So it now goes back to branding. People are buying a DA bag not because it's the same leather as your bag. It's because it's a detailed Africa bag. Yes, it's good quality, but at some point, they begin to buy the brand, right? So when we collaborate, we're not competing. The sky is literally too big for us. Like, we can do so much, right? So, yeah. Thank you very much. A warm round of applause for Muiwa, for Akemi, and Terry. Thank you so much. And of course to Mrs. Olaebi who organized this whole thing and brought us all together. Thank you.
I feel there should have been a government person on the panel, but we're in a transition here, so I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you.